we really need to provide tools and services to a segment that is not served today or very underserved? Can we be matching jobs, skills, people, both physical and digital remote work? The heart, I always tell my team, is about serving the people. Anything that can help improve livelihood of people, we are interested to do. Fantastic, man. Hey, run for MP, Ken. <laughs> I vote for you. <laughs>Hey, welcome back to Edric Pudi Company, the podcast where anybody can inspire everybody. I'm Edric, your host, and this week we've got the CEO and COO of WeShine, Justin Ong and Jay Ng. WeShine is a tech startup that leverages on technology to provide companies and workers with the ideal fit. In short, they find the best fit between people's skills and talents and the organization's job requirements. WeShine is a great platform that provides lower wage workers with suitable job opportunities. We invited Justin and Jay to share their story with us of why WeShine was created, what it can do, and how you could also be an integral part of this whole thing. Wow. Before we get onto the podcast, thank you, thank you, thank you for watching, listening, and supporting the Epic Podcast. Please continue to drop us likes, support, or feedback on our FB, IG, YouTube, or simply following us on your podcast platform. With your continued support, we will continue to get more guests, more support, more wisdom to share on this podcast. Now, Justin and Jay, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Hi, Hi. Hi. Wonderful Hi, to see you. Thanks for having us. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we even started rolling, right, you had this amazing news. We talked a little bit about the platform and how this is going to work. Could you please introduce yourselves? Let's get started with Jay, please. First of all, I'm a father of two. I have a newborn, Clara. Congratulations. Uh, let's see. She's coming to five months now. Quite a handful. Uh, I have a son going to primary school. So he has his primary, to, uh, primary school sorted out. So that's okay. wonderful. Great. Uh, in terms of work, I've done a bit of many things. I'm a jack of all trades. As I look back uh, over my short, coming to 15 years career, primarily in finance to start, mm. trading, investment management. Uh, in terms of business, I've done a couple here and there. Side story is that my first business was printing this uh, design on laptop sleeves. That was uh, when I was in uni, year one, and then getting it manufactured and sold on campus uh, and a tuition center after that. And thereafter, I, I realized that, hey, look, this is really tough. Uh, let's go digital. And then I realized, no, digital is tougher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so now, now I'm uh, working on Shine, as you beautifully say, you know, it's a platform to enable a better fit and better match of people, skills and jobs. Thanks, Jay. Now, uh, Justin, what about yourself? So for me, um, I'm not a father of two, but I often play with Jay's kids. <laughs> Jay will know, like when we go to his house, we spend like 80% meeting, 30% with the kids. I'm actually very, very passionate about uh, contributing back to the community. It happened to me during university, right? Uh, when I when I applied for university, I actually started with civil engineering, right? Engineering course, and then after that, uh, after one semester, uh, I wanted to change my my major, right? And then I have an option between business and economics, and then I was thinking, ah, oh, business is three years course, economics is four years course, but I really wanted to, you know. Uh, play my part in contributing back to the community, right? So I thought, hey, let's uh, let's go with uh, economics, right? Where you know we look at more macroeconomic stuff, especially in the in, in the social front, right? And uh, that is where I started to have this very strong passion to always think about contributing back to the community, right? And then after I graduated, uh, I was in logistics firm doing operations, very hands-on work, right? But thereafter. Like Jay, I, I saw the potential in digital. So I went on to join Lazada and I was doing a very fulfilling role. I was uh, the regional head of Lazada University. My job was to empower uh, micro entrepreneurs to help them bring their businesses online. And it's very fulfilling. Every day, you know, 
that uh, your hard work translates into the livelihood of other people. I progress along that line. And um, I never forget the, the purpose in my career, which is why earlier this year when I was talking to Jay, he, he shared about his vision. Within an hour, I was sold. Uh, he was a very charismatic CEO. So I was sold and uh, I, follow, I, I, I buy into his course and we're, this is where I am today. The difference is that uh, Justin, you know, since, uh, since he's younger, he already has this passion to, to help mm. and to, to produce impact. I'm not like that. Ah. I'm totally not, you know. I, 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 when I started my career, it's all about getting a bigger house, getting a better car, earning more money. Uh, for me, it came relatively late in 2017. When I almost died, sick for 10 months, I was in UK, I wasn't even in Singapore. Very painful, bedridden type of uh, type of uh, sickness. And I didn't know whether I'm going to survive. Three things came to my mind. Number one, uh, health is important because when I was sick, it was really painful. Pain is no joke, man. Yeah. So I said, you know, better take care of your health. Uh, secondly, nothing about uh, material was on my mind. Nothing, zero. I was just thinking about relationships. That was mm. one of my, I, I didn't I didn't realize that, you know, but I was like, oh, look, I, I sort of have a, a glimpse into the future, you know, when, I, when I'm about to pass on in the future. That's what I'll be thinking about. I'm not thinking about my car, my house, or my, uh, you know, whatever, but I'm thinking about relationships. Have I, what have I done in the past in my relationships and future? My son then was one. He's a young, you know, very still very young. And I was thinking, oh, he can't, he, he, he's not, a, I'm not able to teach him anything now. If I tell him anything, he cannot remember. How am I, and if I just pass on th then, how am I going to teach him anything? So yeah. I even thought of, okay, I'm going to write letters. Every year, he's going to open one. And then I'll say, hey, look, son, today you're 30 years old. This is a lesson for you. So relationship, finally, impact. So I shared a little bit earlier that uh, I started my career as a trader and all that. All those are good things, okay? So no judgment, not, nothing, nothing of that sort. But personally, what was I thinking? I was thinking that the nurse that attended to me brought me a lot of comfort. Doctors are wonderful. I think up to that point, I've never uh, really appreciated nurses. I was like, no, look, without the nurse, I, you know, uh, I don't have that kind of uh, care. Um, after the doctor has attended to, to me and to us. And then I was thinking, what have I done with my career? What is my impact on society? If I make a good trade, I make a million dollar for this whatever institution. Okay, good. That's, that's wonderful. But, and again, not saying that there's no impact at all. No, of, of course not. We all live and we all have some impact in, in, in the world that we live in. But I'm thinking to myself, is that enough? So then I tell myself, okay, look, if I survive this and I start thinking about my future career, the next phase of my career, I better remember about social, mm. about impact. Thank you so much for sharing that because it really does bring a lot of light to why we do what we do, what we love to do. And I think it's really about that purpose. Just, just today, in fact, I was watching a certain interview with uh, Tom Hiddleston. You, you know that actor, right? Tom Hiddleston, uh, the one who played Loki in The Avengers. So he was at a talk and he mentioned that everybody has two lives. The first one that we are born, we live. The second one is when we truly realize, right, that we live life because we only have one life. You know, wow. that life, you, you realize your mortality. So that is when you truly truly live your second life and uh, i think jay and justin this uh very very much relates uh, to what you had to say over to you justin now you were mentioning earlier on that you drank the kool-aid okay basically jay had pitched you something that you've never heard it touched your heartstrings now could you contextualize that for the audience and just basically what was it that he said that went i have to be a part of this well, it's actually a very prominent problem that uh, Jay rightly pointed out. Um, earlier this year, we were actually recovering from COVID. My dad was, um, he's not the most, uh, very highly educated. He's just a uh, normal, hardworking. He, he used to be in the logistic industry, hard labor. He moved on 
to driving the tourist bus, which he enjoys a lot. He's very outgoing and he enjoys talking to the tourists and all. So he enjoys a lot. But when COVID hits, he was at home for six months straight. No job, no income. It's actually okay because uh, he has three kids and then we are all working. So actually we are, we are okay to survive. But you see, to him, to stay at home for six months for someone who is very outgoing, it's torturous. To support him, right? And I went out with, with him looking for jobs. So we, we seek out um those kind of uh, e-commerce delivery uh, men. Right. right. And I went to the interview with him. And uh, on the first day of the job, I actually do the delivery together with him so that uh, I got him on how to use the app and all, right? But when I was in this interview with him, I, then I saw some uh, I saw some gaps, right? During the interview, they, they don't really assess you in terms of your skill sets whatsoever. All they care about is if you are willing to put in your time, your effort, then I hire you. Which is okay for some jobs, but think about it this way. If you are in a job that requires a little bit more skills, right? How can someone like my father accurately profile himself. So that is the that is the problem that I saw. Uh, then Jay came and say, you know, uh, he's looking at a smarter way, a smarter way that uh, profiled our blue collar workers so much better. They are also very essential to our economy. Are we neglecting them? Who is showing this concern towards this, uh, this pool of essential and uh, very talented worker who which has who has a lot of experience, right? And I think that uh, this is what really relates to me. This is something that um, it relates to my purpose and something that we shouldn't wait. We should jump on it immediately, especially now in this COVID situation. I realize that you're using data, you're using machine learning. How does this actually impact the way that we actually do the um, job suitability, job sourcing, and also how we do the employability aspect? I'll take this one. If today uh, you, are, you are applying for a job like uh, what my what the, the roles that uh, my father is looking for, right, back then, my dad doesn't have a LinkedIn account, but he has a Facebook account. He has a TikTok account, right? Every day they are scrolling <laughs> TikTok, right? We must reach out to our our talents, right, in a, in a platform that they are comfortable with. And think about it this way today, what are the platforms they are comfortable with? We want to have a platform where they are comfortable using and that is where we start. Today, do we require them to write a CV? It is very difficult, right? But what are we concerned about? We are concerned about the skills, the experience, as well as the personality. So today, I can profile him without a CV. Of course, tech can come in and help, right? with uh, whatever uh, basic information they put in, even uh, through audio, through video, right? We can use NLP to extract out. And then after that, we do the match using tech. So in that sense, we are actually lowering the barrier of uh, tech usage, right? Because of uh, the medium and the way we collect the data. And then using tech to make the whole process a lot more efficient. And on the other hand, let's say today you are an employer. Would you read the whole CV? I've been hiring a few. I don't actually read the whole CV. What I do is I picked out key skill sets that, I, that I'm interested in. And today, tech can help to do that, right? And tech can ensure that uh, today when I bring someone to you, right, the skill sets are there. And uh, something that uh, tech can do, which uh, replaces human interview, is the ability to suss out some personality traits. All of this done before an interview, it is going to make the whole hiring process so much more efficient. And uh, this is what our platform aims to do. We know the problem now. Employers may not read the CVs. Employees or potential employees don't know how to market themselves, brand themselves, package themselves in a way that the employer can truly understand it and therefore see the value in why I should join your company or I should hire you in that sense. Now, Jay, for your side, when it comes to WeShine, what's the grand vision of WeShine? I know we just started out, but what exactly do you see the company growing into um, to be able to not just help Singaporeans, but perhaps are we looking at, I don't know, higher income uh, individuals looking for such a solution or are we growing into some giant unicorn and empire of employability around the world? What are we really doing here? Yeah, 
I think to start with that, we I have to share with you uh, the story and the journey of what happened, you know, before today. Mm. I was building uh, Stats. It's a B two B fintech. We are we have our own technology, including a focus on blockchain. And a big part of that, we always talk about financial inclusion, right? And there was one day, uh, so fast forward a couple of years, I think two years or two and a half years after we started Stats. And I, I was already thinking about WeShine, but I'm still uh, building Stats. And I was thinking about WeShine from a very broad uh, pros- perspective, so to speak, which is uh, poverty alleviation, which is SDG number one. Now then at one conference, there was this uh, lady who runs a very successful payment app in the region, I will not name, and uh, there was a question to her. So this was a FinTech conference. There was a question to her about as a payment um, company and you talk about financial inclusion because I talk about financial inclusion as well. I come from the capital market space. I say that, look, if we can start building an exchange in Mongolia that enables the flow of capital from people who need it and people who have it to flow. And we're talking about cap- flow of capital to the SMEs in, Mang- in Mongolia on the list exchange. So that's what we have been talking about. And then here from a uh, B to C point of view, um, this lady actually says, very interestingly, she says that it actually let matter less whether uh, somebody has an account or not, because a lot of times in today's fintech space, they talk about financial financial inclusion by saying that now look if uh, if you are the unbank, you you come on board and then you have a you have a so called a, a wallet or bank account on your mobile phone, right? Yeah, so that's wonderful. Again, that's wonderful. But she mentioned one thing. She said that if you really want to talk about financial inclusion, it's about how much money you have in that account. And that strikes a chord. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I believe in. And that means that we are moving upstream. It means that whatever that I'm talking about, about financial inclusion, that's wonderful. But if you do not have money in your bank account, in the e-wallet, is that really uh, beneficial? That really, I mean, among many other things, that's one of the things, right? And one of the story that I'll share with you that really tell me that, look, if my vision is to improve livelihood of people, and that is that is our vision, it's a big vision, and it's intentional. We went through uh, uh, another visioning type of, um, or branding guide type of uh, exercise two, one month ago. They were like, okay, let's reload the vision. I said, no. I'm not going to change my vision. The vision is to improve livelihood of people. That doesn't change. That doesn't change now. That doesn't change 10 years from now, 20 years from now. We want to do that. What does livelihood mean? Right? So if you, if I go deeper into it, and it's intentional, livelihood to me is the means of living. It means that you need to be able, if, if I use that analogy, which is, I, I do not want to give you a fish, but to teach you how to fish, right? It, it's really that. And if, if I start thinking about that, then it's really about jobs and skills. Jobs and skills. That's why it is. Because if I have the ability in some ways to make sure that people around us, especially outside of Singapore, you talk about is the vision just about it. No. When I started, actually, another side story, I'm like, I'm not going to do anything in Singapore. <laughs> why? <laughs> because the government has done such a good job. Yeah, jobs and skills everywhere. Right, you look that, that logo, like, and they have skills futures, they have E2I. It's, it's wonderful. Government is doing a wonderful job. You look at Africa, you look at um, neighboring countries. I think there's a lot more to be done because uh, also there's a lot more people at the base of pyramid. Right, so coming back to jobs and skills, if the vision again is to improve livelihood of people, we want to make sure that we have tools that's available to people today that they are not served. I think you and I, we are served very well. Yep. Sometimes, I mean, I don't have hate others coming to me. My friends have. They say, hey, look, there's this job. You know, they want to take it. You have a lot of uh, ways to upskill yourself. You know how to go online search. Uh, you have you have LinkedIn now. You have nice CV. You have uh, resume writing courses. Many things. 
Again, if I take a look at people at the base of pyramid, what do they have? What do they have? Today, if you are a, if you are a young person who has left your village, you, you, you're in Ho Chi Minh or you're in Jakarta, you finish school, what's next? Sure, there are some things, but can more be done? And when I, when I say you finish school, I'm talking about vocational school. I'm talking about blue-collar youths. So our purpose to improve livelihood, we need to do something for them. We need to provide tools and services that's relevant. There are tools and services. Are they relevant to, to people that we are trying to serve? Maybe not. So that's, uh, that's our starting point. And back to your very question, what is my vision? My vision is that we really need to provide tools and services to a segment that is not served today or very underserved. And if you look at it, uh, youth unemployment is a very big issue. Um, there are many reports that, that, that stated, you know, uh, in fact, one of my, one of my partner in Africa was just showing me that in right now in South Africa, youth unemployment is about 60%, you know, it's, it's unimaginable. And, uh, what can we do for them now? Jobs, skills, and people. And when I think about jobs, uh, it was COVID, right? So then I'm like, Hey, look, we're not just thinking about physical jobs. Because never in the history of mankind have we been forced to go through a grand experiment like this. You know, everything connected. This was at the beginning, circuit breaker in Singapore. And like literally everything is online. I celebrate, I celebrate my birthday online and, you know, we, we've all been through that. But there lies an opportunity. If today you are in, you are in this particular village, or suburban of Jakarta or of Ho Chi Minh, whatsoever. Can we then bring you some jobs that is digital remote? Yes, you have gig, but can we do more than gig? That's really what we want to do. Can we be matching jobs, skills, people, both physical and digital remote work? I think that's the grand vision. And underpinning that, of course, as Justin has said, is about data. Because again, uh, to me, Data today is like electricity of the past. I'm a firm believer of machine learning, uh, not just for the sake of it. I always say that I think technology has to uh, solve a problem, but I do think that we have some machinery. Just like in the past, we, we started to have mach like real machine, you know, hardware, computers. I think now we have additional machinery. Uh, AI is one of them. I think that machinery, whenever you look at history of mankind, whenever you have better machinery, there's better productivity and there's a better way that we can use um, improvement in machinery to improve uh, society. So to me, I think all these things come together and I'm like, all right, you know, we, we got to do something that, that, um, that utilize these tools and opportunities that we are seeing in front of us. But most importantly, you know, I've been talking about the... Um, the, the tech and the vision, but most importantly, the heart. The heart, I always tell my team, is about serving the people. That is fundamental, you know. Today, no matter what uh, other technology comes along or what machinery or whatever things that happen, if our heart is right, we say that, yes, we want to improve livelihood of people. Now we talk about finding jobs, and that's just one part of it. But if you think about the vision, it's about anything that can help improve livelihood of people, we are interested to do because that is the vision. Fantastic, man. Hey, run for MP, Ken. <laughs> I vote for you. <laughs> run for MP, Ken. I, I, I'll go to your constitution. All right. Hey, uh, okay, jokes aside, Jay, you had two points uh, that I wanted to address. Number one is financial inclusion. Uh, can yes. you uh, please uh, uh, share the light and make it simple for me to understand what exactly financial in uh, financial inclusion is? Maybe from me and then uh, also what I see the industry is talking about. Today, okay. I talk about industry first. I think, uh, and again, this disclaimer, this is my own interpretation of what industry is talking about. Um, I see that today's industry is always talking about, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, serving the unbanked. There's a lot of talk about that, right? So perhaps in Philippines, in Indonesia, there's a whole bunch of... Um, of people who do not have a bank account. So most of the services are like, can I bring some of this through maybe an application? 
to, to, the, to the people in this way. And from there, perhaps I can bring some products and services, financial products and services, micro loans, maybe micro insurance, uh, maybe even uh, insurance savings products to people who do not have a bank account. I think that's what, um, that's at least that's what I've seen the industry move over the last three, five years. Uh, again, I've mentioned it. To me, that's wonderful. But I think that financial inclusion to me has two components. Number one is the upstream. It's the fact that, yes, you have access to services. But I think of, I think of financial services because I started my career in finance. Uh, as I think about financial services, I think that a lot of times it is only re it is relevant mostly when you already have some savings of sorts. So yes, perhaps one of the product is that uh, is, is a savings account on on mobile phone. Yes, but that also means that you do need to have the ability to save. So to me, I'm always going upstream, right? I'm like, okay, how do we get to the point that uh, the people that we are trying to serve? actually has money to save and they are not they're not worrying day to day about their next meal uh, tomorrow or the school fees of their of their children so that's that's one uh and then the other part is maybe this is this is uh being a little bit uh skeptical <laughs> again i'm just speaking from my own my own personal view my own mind is that not all financial products are beneficial to everyone mm. for example loans Loans are wonderful, yes, if you know how to use it properly. But can loans also be misused? Uh, as I think about the, the end user, that could be, right? That could be the case. Um, of course, from an institution point of view, there are, there are ways to mitigate. And uh, that's another conversation, conversation on its own, right? Perhaps the ethics of it and all, all that. But I think, again, with data point, if I have better, better data point, Perhaps, can I then um, be recommending the right product to the right person? Uh, not that we are going to do, I'm not sure whether we're going to do this in the future or not, or in whatever ways, but just an idea, right? If today I know that uh, you're always hardworking, I know that uh, you've always been performing well in, in, jo in your jobs, and perhaps you even are very proactive to upskill, and uh, in Justin talk about personality. We know that your personality is that uh, you are forward looking, you're honest, you have integrity. Then today you ask for a loan, a micro loan. Can we then give you uh, at a rate that is not a burden on you, but a rate that is empowering? Because from whatever I know about you, if you're asking for a loan, maybe you really need it for an emergency. Maybe your mom is ill or you need it for whatever reasons. If that is the case and the likelihood of you returning is, is much higher. So it's almost like a, like a customized recommendation or customized product. Yeah, that is what I see financial inclusion should be. Again, not saying that we'll do that or not because today we are very focused on what we do, all about jobs and skills. Uh, but that's one example. Uh, if you ask me about financial inclusion, Wearing not a wee shine hat, but perhaps uh, just an observer of fintech hat. Fantastic. And second question was, what exactly is youth the your definition of youth unemployment? Because back then, for us, youth unemployment was when we were sixteen and we needed a part time job so we could get <laughs> extra money, right? And we couldn't find yeah. one because we didn't want to work for a fast food chain or we wanted didn't want to do banquet jobs. But what exactly is youth unemployment? Yes, University of Cambridge came up with a report, wonderful report that basically um, surveyed many of the developing countries, mostly in South Asia, Africa, less in ASEAN. But I think some of these problems are uh, quite common. What is the problem? The problem is that youths are underemployed. I think unemployment is one where you come out, you cannot find a job. Yes, uh, what we are seeing, at least over the last one and a half years, is that uh, youths are unemployed, meaning today I may graduate from university or vocational school or wherever I am. I cannot find a job. There's no jobs, right? So end up, I do something that um, pays the bills, pays for my rent. Many of these are in urban cities and they don't, 
um, they are not native to where they stay, so they need to rent a place. And then uh, they just take any job that comes along. I cannot remember the figure off my head, but it's a very high percentage of youth that are un undergoing this type of situation. Um, and then lies this opportunity of, again, I, I, I mentioned that sometimes uh, if you look at the job market as a whole, it's one of the most inefficient market still. Um, so can better data, can better recommendation algo help solve some of these problems? We think so. And confidently so. Because matching, uh, again, if I think about jobs, not just about physical, but digital remote, it is a matter of finding the right person. It's like dating, right? I mean, to me, all along, <laughs> since my younger days, I, I've always felt that job search is about dating. And it's about, today, if I, if I want to find something that suits me, what do I do? Where do I go? Who do I trust? And so if better data point and relevant data point, uh, we, have, we, have, we have done some work. I think the data, the saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so the data has to be relevant in the first place. If we are able to get the relevant data, I think downstream in this matching process will be a lot more relevant and, and useful. Um, and again, down the road, I think midterm, you know, we hope that uh, this can even be cross-border type of matching. Now, gig economy is something that came up and a lot of people ask me about that. Uh, again, I think that gig economy is good, but perhaps uh, what can be done a little bit further on top of gig economy so Git is like freelance job, right? Today, I want to find somebody to, uh, to do a logo. I go on a, on a platform. I find somebody in, in another country who can do it for me at a much more, I would say, um, perhaps affordable uh, price. So that's Git. And then once off, I pay you the money, that's it. Some of them have Git a little bit longer term. That's more like business process outsourcing. Um, so I think all, all, all those are, are good things. One thing that in my heart matters, which is this sense of um, security. Because I think, again, not everybody is suitable to be a gig worker. A lot of times when we do, when we work, when we, when we are seeking employment, one of the things that we are looking for is a sense of security. You do not really want, I mean, gig to me is more like a freelance, more, you need somebody who is a little bit more entrepreneurial to say, I'm willing to, to take a risk I'm willing to go into this. If my business is not good, then I have no I have no money. But I think not everybody is suitable for that. I think it takes a certain kind of people <laughs> to do entrepreneurship. And many people ask me, uh, would you encourage? I do encourage, but I think it's a very hard thing to do entrepreneurship. So <laughs> uh, because of that, and I, I know that most people are not suitable. So I say that the default answer I always give is no, <laughs> don't, don't, don't do a startup, don't start a business unless after I tell you no, you don't care about me, you go ahead anyway, then yes, you're the right guy. Same thing, I think gig economy requires a little bit of that attitude. Again, not everyone is suitable for that. So if we can start thinking about employment cross-border, but not just about gig, but saying that yes, you are gainfully employed, you have benefits, you have uh, health benefits, you have uh, insurance and things like that. Um, that would be ideal in my, in my, in my mind. Is it, each, is, it, is it easy to get there? I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, but this is again a bit of a visioning. I think that, that would be wonderful to give people that kind of security and dignity in, in work. Thanks you so much for that. That is a wonderful, wonderful point that you are bringing up now that, uh, you know, jobs are no longer necessarily focused on a local or hyper-local kind, of um, uh, kind of a setting. But because of technology, we're now able to then find employability and not just get the talent in, but also send the talent out so that yeah. Singapore in itself can also show how much talent that we have. You know, uh, in the previous uh, episode of the podcast, I was talking to Sunny. Sunny Pang is, is an actor. He's a stuntman. He's a stunt director, action choreographer. He's, he's on Netflix, man. How many Singaporeans yeah. can you say have gone to Netflix? You know what I'm saying? So 
the point here is that even in any scene that we have, I believe Singapore has wonderful talent. And uh, if we shine, can definitely help them to shine. That would be wonderful. And do you really think that job interviews in the future will all essentially be taken over by machines? No. No. <laughs> so, no. Jay, you were the first one why? to answer. So, yeah, why? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because uh, it's dating. Finding a candidate, finding a job is finding a wife. <laughs> you can't find a wife through a machine. But what the machine can do is to make the process a lot more efficient. You think about your dating apps, for example. Uh, in the past, how, how was dating done? Long time ago, not our era, is uh, matchmaking, right? <laughs> your, uh, I don't know. We, I, I've never we were writing a... notes, my friend. We were writing <laughs> notes all over the place, sending things, you know, uh, throwing rocks in. Okay, we don't. We, that, that was yeah. a different time. <laughs> <laughs> matchmaking. You know, you think about the olden days. Uh, then I think it became more of a word of mouth. And then it became a matchmaking agency. If you, if you recall that, you had agencies doing that. Uh, today is about dating apps. I mean, I, I I don't use a dating app. My wife will kill me. But <laughs> uh, that's so what technology can out. do. <laughs> let's, not, let's not go there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was saying technology can, can do that because it helps reduce friction, increase efficiency, and again, cross-border. Today, I think uh, there's a lot of stories that people just... Uh, know each other through a dating app and then they can be from different ethnic groups different countries even uh and then they come together of course beware the love scams mm -hmm. but i think the, the same the same thing for, for jobs is that ultimately it has to be a very personal thing but the technology can allow the friction to be reduced can allow the process to be a lot more smoother and the efficiency it is about finding it's about finding Dating app, again, is about finding. A, before dating app, I can look. I mean, when I went to school, so-called my pool is my classmate, right? I'm looking for people uh, within, my uh, within my uni and all that. Mm -hmm. Same for jobs. If today there's no technology, you'll be looking for jobs around you. But with technology, it allows things to be much broader and you're able to find things. But when it's, when it's so broad, it's impossible for you to find because humans don't have the capacity to filter and to spend all that time to, to find something that suits you. That's where technology comes in to help. I like that because, uh, you know, I maybe I because I grew up with watching all Terminator movies, so I kind of do believe in Skynet. One of these days is going to happen, right? Now, this one's a quick one for you guys. It's about your leadership. All right. So, um, Jay and Justin, I would like to for you to take a second to think about your favorite leadership trait about each other. Justin, tell me your favorite leadership trait about Jay. And Jay, what's your favorite leadership trait about Justin? Justin, go. Um, favorite one, authentic leadership, right? He's, he's, he's what you see, right? He is what he is, right? And uh, there's no doubts. There's no uh, nothing to hide, you know, and uh, very, very clear purpose and very genuine uh, heart. So... There's, there's no need to guess and uh, it's very open kind of uh, leadership. So it makes the whole working experience a lot more easier. Thank you. And Jay, what's your favorite leadership trait about Justin? He listens. He's a good listener. Mm. Fantastic. All right, gents, thank you so much for sharing a lot, a lot, a lot during this um, this wonderful podcast. So we've got one last thing that we always do on every show, and that is a quick rapid fire session that we have with our guests. So uh, it's a string of 10 questions. Now we will go in the order of Jay and then Justin. So are you guys ready for the epic questionnaire? All right. All right, let's go. Okay, so question number one. What's your favorite word? Discipline. Love. One word that you dislike the most? Procrastination. Pride. If you could have a conversation with somebody, fictional, non-fictional, dead or alive, who would that be? Steve Jobs. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Cool. Okay. What do you say to yourself in the mirror every morning? Yes, you can. 
。Hello。<laughs> Name one superpower that you would like to have. Slow down time. To fly. Oh, okay, interesting. It's always about time, and it's always about flying. You know, really, no. I've I've done forty five <laughs> of these, right? I've done forty five of these, right? And it's like it's always almost the same. It's very interesting. I have to do some research on this. All right, next one. <laughs> Favorite travel spot or the next travel spot that you like to go to once borders open up? New Zealand. Oh, this is difficult. Ah,、uh, I don't know Japan. Hmm. Okay. Something in the arts that you've always wanted to do but yet to do so. Drawing. As in. Learn piano.、Uh, oh, okay. So one is on lit actual art and、uh, sorry, phys、uh, drawing, and the other one is in music. Wait, I want to change. I want to do、change. violin more. <laughs> really? Okay.、Yeah. Okay, that works too. And、yeah. what does retirement look like to you? A peaceful living. That's to me. I always say be a farmer. My wife will correct me, because I don't want to farm. I'm a farmer that doesn't farm. So my wife said, "You want to live in a farmhouse, not not be a farmer." <laughs>、mm, interesting. Living in a farmhouse. Okay, nice. Last question: How do you want to be remembered? What's your legacy? Impactful. I don't know, man. This is hard. Ah,、uh, mm -hmm. this is really hard. <laughs> He's a good servant. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, being so open, even sharing your vulnerabilities about what could, what may not happen. You know,、uh, again, thank you for choosing this platform to share so much more about We Shine, and ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, thank you so much for tuning in to the Epic Podcast. All right, and this is me, Edric Poon and Company, with of course Jay Ung and Justin Ong of We Shine. So, if you are actually looking for, you know,、um, employability in the future, looking for yourself,、uh, look out for yourself. Use technology. Don't be afraid. Reach out to the guys over at WeShine dot com. Check it out. All right. Support them, and they will support you as well as much as they can, of course. And of course,、uh, for me, do me a favor: like, comment, subscribe. Just join us. Do whatever it is that you do on the internet. Show, continue to show us support, and we will continue to get quality on this platform, as you see. All right. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out, and we will see you next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.